And we give you the full screen. There we go. Cool. I hope you're all excited. I'm excited. It's actually my first uh, Drupal Dev Days. So really cool to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm Alexander Farag. I work for Open Social, where I'm a lead engineer. Uh, and today I want to talk to you about what I think we might need to do to keep Drupal relevant in uh, the modern web. Let me also make sure I have my speaker notes going forward. There I go. So I want to start my story in 2011. That's when uh, Drupal 7 was first released. And it's a year before I started using Drupal myself. Um, that's about 10 years ago in 2012. I was already building websites using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, even some PHP. Um, but I needed to build a website for my sports association where I tracked matches, teams, uh, results. And Drupal seemed like a really good match because it gave me all these things for free, like data architecture, uh, login, user management, all these things. And if we continue the story, then I came for the code. In 2013, I uh, joined my first DrupalCon in Prague at the time. And I was really warmly welcomed by the Drupal community. And that's also where I met my current employer. Even though I couldn't join them at the time because I was still uh, studying, I met them there. Uh, and now, some years later, I'm there. If we fast forward to 2015, then we all know Drupal 8 was released. And this was a major shift going from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. It was accompanied with a redesign of the Drupal.org website. Uh, and for Drupal 8, we really, as a community, made this push to get off our island, adopt more Symfony. But it also led to a little bit of a difficult upgrade cycle uh, that we might still see with Drupal 7 only having end of life in, I believe, January 25 was now when it was going to happen. Um, but one of the things Drupal 8 did bring with Symfony is a standardization of tooling. And if we go further, uh, then we get to 2016, a little bit of my personal story. That's when I finally joined Open Social after meeting them uh, at DrupalCon in 2013. Um, but if we fast forward all the way to 2020, so that's four and a half years later, then we get to the release of Drupal 9. And this is where we showed that we learned from the Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 upgrade path. And I believe the upgrade to Drupal 9 was a lot easier. And it promised us that it would remain that way. And we've seen that only two years later with Drupal 10, uh, where like, we have all the cool new features in the Drupal 9 minor releases, and the Drupal 9 to 10 upgrade was a lot easier. Of course, today we're in 2023. Great, great week ahead of uh, Drupal Developer Days. Um, but if we look ahead a little bit further than the coming week to next year, hopefully in August or December, we'll see the launch of Drupal 11. And you might be wondering why I'm retelling history, because I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this story. But we can remove my personal story from this timeline and then take a look at the gaps between Drupal major versions. And we can see that between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, there was roughly four and a half years. And again, we needed four and a half years to get from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9. And then things started speeding up with only two and a half years from Drupal 9 to Drupal 10. And hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, uh, we'll have Drupal 10 to Drupal 11 in another two years. And you might see this, and you'll be excited, and I'm excited that we're accelerating, and we're launching new features more quickly. We're able to get rid of technical debt more quickly. But we're not the only ones that are moving this fast out on the web. So today, I want to draw a similar timeline for some other projects. And in this case, I want to look at JavaScript, TypeScript, and Rust. And the reason I chose these languages is that, first of all, I'm familiar with them, but also that if people are evaluating tools to create a new web project, then these are the tools they're going to pitch Drupal against. If they're maybe looking to learn a new language or looking to learn a new tool, rather than if they're already familiar with Drupal and if they're already knowing what uh, Drupal is uh, possible or is capable of. So let's take a look at the timeline of JavaScript first. Uh, all the way back in 2006, jQuery was first announced. 
Uh, it's, yeah, we're now finally in Drupal replacing it with more and more vanilla JavaScript. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers MooTools. Had some discussion about it yesterday, whether people actually used it. I can, ensure, is, uh, I can assure you people actually used it. Um, but if we move up to 2009, that was the introduction of Node.js. And that's when uh, really JavaScript started to move from the client to the server, and the popularity of JavaScript on the server also ballooned, bringing us isomorphic applications with code that ran both client-side and server-side. In 2010, we had two new front-end libraries and a back-end library. We had Backbone.js, which was one of the first libraries using the model view controller uh, paradigm on the client side. We also had the first release of AngularJS, that's 1.0. Uh, and we had Express.js, which is probably one of the major JavaScript backend web frameworks uh, that is still getting used today, and it inspired a whole generation of new ones. In 2011, we saw Ember.js, also another popular option uh, that I'm sure you've heard of that used this model view controller paradigm. And 2012 uh, saw the release of TypeScript. So this is already 11 years ago, even though within the JavaScript community, it feels like TypeScript really is something of the last five years. But they've been at this for a long time. React came a year later in May, celebrating its 10-year anniversary this year, followed shortly by Vue.js, an alternative to writing front-end applications. And these two really saw the introduction uh, of derived UI. Then we have GraphQL as a new way to get data between server and client in 2015. I put this into the JavaScript timeline because the spec reference implementation is in JavaScript, and that's where most of the activity happens if you look at GraphQL clients and, uh, and client innovation. And in 2016, we saw another few uh, front-end framework. So we saw Angular 2.0, which was a complete rewrite. We saw Next.js, one of the first meta frameworks that took React and started to bring that to the back end and help you set up the server-side rendering of things. A day after the release of Next.js, we saw Nuxt.js, which was the equivalent to Next.js, but for Vue, if that's more to your liking. And finally, we also saw Svelte, which tried to rethink how we did data binding in the UI layer compared to React. Um, in 2017, Jordan Walk, the creator of React, thought, hey, I don't really like TypeScript. I think we can do better. So he took OCaml uh, and he built ReasonML, which could compile both to native and to JavaScript. Um, I personally like what he was doing over TypeScript, but TypeScript has much broader support. So if you're starting a new project now, uh, yeah, make your choices. We also saw Gatsby, which was another React-based meta framework that was more aimed at static uh, site generation. And 2018 brought us Stimulus, which went back a little bit to the easier JavaScript ways, where their motto is a modest JavaScript framework for the HTML that you already have. This was brought to us by the people from uh, 37 Signals, uh, the people behind Basecamp. And in 2019, we saw Lit with web components. And we saw Red with JS, another meta framework built on React, trying to give you authentication, GraphQL API endpoints. Uh, and we saw React Query, which I think was quite a turning point in the JavaScript world, because GraphQL had a lot of clients to make data fetching easy. But if you were using something like JSON API, then data fetching was quite a bit more difficult, and getting your caching right on the client was challenging. So Tanner Lindsley brought us uh, React Query, and I think that gave a really compelling alternative if you're using JSON API. And finally, that same year, we got Alpine.js, which tries to be a minimal front-end framework, describing itself as jQuery for the modern web. So maybe that's something we can look at now that we're getting rid of jQuery. Um, in 2020, we saw another framework, Blitz.js, and we saw Rescript, which is a fork of ReasonML. The people that were working on the JavaScript compiler wanted more control, so they took it away and created a different typed language that compiles to JavaScript. And finally, in 2021, uh, we got Solid.js uh, and Svelte. And I think 
where Svelte brought reactivity to the UI as a core framework. Uh, SolidJS introduced the same reactivity, but with more familiar look and feel for people useful for React. And Remix, I always compare a little bit as the Drupal for uh, JavaScript developers, not because it does all of the great data architecture things that Drupal does, but if you already have a backend, uh, then Remix makes it really easy to organize your data fetching, um, make your um, backend for front end, so to say. So as you can see, there's a huge flurry of activity uh, over these nearly 15 years in the JavaScript community. And one of the things that you heard often if you were in the JavaScript community is that they were overwhelmed, that there was framework fatigue. And if you see this slide, then that's kind of understandable because these aren't probably even all of the libraries that are released, but these are just the most popular ones that were changing things up in some way. Um, but I, I do want to share some overall trends. Because we started out slowly with JavaScript providing some frameworks to make DOM manipulations easier for smaller interactions within the application that you were already shipping. Then we got JavaScript brought to the server, and we got some more advanced UI frameworks with these model view controller paradigms. We got types, which I think these days you shouldn't start a new project without using a type language, because it just catches so much bugs and prevents so much hassle. And then we evolved into, a, into a, an ecosystem that used frameworks to generate its UI. And this was no longer using some JavaScript to change the UI while a user was working on it, but really to take data that comes in and derive a UI from that and ship it to the browser or show it to the user. And I think that is something that we still see in how uh, front-end applications get built. And with this UI driving, uh, libraries, we now see meta frameworks, which are taking these things that are only concerned with the UI and actually adding tools for data fetching, uh, client side or server side rendering, and all the complex day to day operations that you normally need to think about when building a larger uh, yeah, web application. And this also means that the innovation in the JavaScript frameworks is changing from being really focused on innovating how UI works to being focused on how that can be more tightly integrated with the backend. How can I do my authentication, interact with all these external services? Uh, and that's what these frameworks are working on to make, make it easier. Um, the other language I want to look at is Rust. Uh, oh, sorry, I wanted to highlight three meta frameworks in particular. That's uh, because if we look at their business model, they're interesting because they have uh, a framework which is open source, and they drive that to get adoption. And then they offer cloud services to uh, get revenue. So we have Gatsby with Gatsby Cloud, making it easy to deploy your Gatsby application. Next.js with Fresel's front-end cloud. Uh, and Blitz.js, which is pushing flight control, which isn't a cloud of its own, but it's a tool to provide you with uh, infrastructure as code, but basically on AWS rather than in a niche um, data center. And I think these business models are something we can learn from that I'll get back to later. Next up is Rust. Rust actually also started in 2006, uh, the same year that jQuery was announced, but as an internal project at Mozilla Research. Um, so if anyone was using Drupal at the time, that was back when Drupal 4 was still the thing. Drupal 5 would be released a year later. Uh, in 2009, Rust got sponsorship officially by Mozilla as part of a project to build a new uh, rendering engine called Servo. And if you're using Firefox, then that's the rendering engine you're using these days. And then if we go forward all the way to 2014, we saw Iron. And that was the first web framework in the Rust language to build uh, mostly backend things, APIs, things like that. And it marketed itself as an extensible concurrent web framework for Rust. It was actually released before Rust was declared stable, which was only a year later. So if you feel like Rust is a new language, that's because it hasn't really been stable for 10 years, but it's been in development for about 17. 
Rocket released in December of 2016. It's a web framework that makes it easy to write fast, secure web applications without sacrificing flexibility, usability, and type safety. So that's a mouthful. And I'm reading out the way these frameworks describe themselves because you, I hope you'll see a, see a trend there. Going forward to 2018, we saw Actix Web, which is a powerful, pragmatic, extremely fast web framework for Rust. These were web servers that we talk about, but here also one of the larger UI frameworks comes up, and that's U. It's a framework for creating reliable and efficient web applications, and that allowed you to write a JSX-like syntax in Rust, so basically HTML in Rust. And I think that's also why I always consider it uh, Rust's first React. Going to 2019, we see Warp, which is another web server. It's a super easy composable web server framework for warp speeds. And we saw Seed, another front-end framework, catering to fast and reliable web apps with an Elm-like architecture. 2020 saw more innovation with Tide, a fast and friendly HTTP uh, server framework for async Rust. We saw Sauron, which is more focused on the front end, a versatile web framework and library for building client-side and or server-side web applications with strong focus on simplicity, and it is suited for developing web applications using progressive rendering. So there we see the mention of one of these things that if you look what is table stakes already in JavaScript, getting the progressive rendering, server-side rendering, client-side rendering, also coming to the Rust ecosystem. And finally, Iced, which is a cross-platform graphical user interface library for Rust focused on simplicity and type safety. 2021 saw Salvo, an extremely simple and powerful Rust web backend framework, and they're focused specifically on simplicity, so they're already starting to pivot away from the type safety that everyone else was advertising with. And Poem, which is another server-side library for a full-featured, easy-to-use web framework for the Rust programming language. And then finally, in 2022, we have Deoxys. It's a React-inspired library focused on developer experience, built fast, beautiful, and fully featured apps for every platform in less time. So you can already see they're going with these cross-platform uh, yeah, advertisements. We have Sycamore, a reactive library for creating web apps in Rust and WebAssembly. So bringing in that reactivity that we also saw in the JavaScript uh, timeline. And Axum is a web application framework that focuses on ergonomics and modularity. And then, if you think last year was enough, we already had a release. Uh, this year, oh, I think my slides are out of sync. Now we had Laptops, laptops which mixes front end and back end into a cutting edge full stack Rust framework for the modern uh, web. So you can see that in the Rust ecosystem, the innovation started a bit later, but you can see a similar trend of this accelerating innovation, where they're looking at what the JavaScript ecosystem is doing and trying to move that uh, to Rust. And the early web frameworks were really all about using Rust's type safety and use that as an advertisement. But you already see with the newer frameworks that type safety is something that's just common to all of Rust, so it's no longer an advertisement. And they're really starting to push uh, for going full stack. Uh, one of the advantages is Rust is it's a compiled language, so it can run anywhere, the browser, mobile, native desktop, so that's what the UI libraries are pushing for, uh, and also bringing in that reactivity to start making it uh, easier to fetch data. I don't think we really have the meta frameworks like we see in JavaScript yet, but I do think in a year or two that we'll see that same shift of having frameworks that can do your UI, can do a login for you, can do your data fetching, make your API routes, talk to the database if you need it, because talking to databases, other services, those are things other Rust applications uh, are already really good at. So that just needs to be adopted for a web, uh, a web sphere. So you may be thinking, why would I care about what all these other languages are doing? Because we're using PHP, we're using Drupal, but the problem is that other people outside of the Drupal community, outside of PHP, do care. And I think the State of Developer Ecosystem by JetBrains survey, uh, this is from 2022, is a really good illustration for this. So let's take a closer look at JavaScript, TypeScript, Rust, and PHP. 
One of the things you can see is that PHP's popularity is declining. So fewer people are willing to work with PHP, are working uh, with PHP. It looks like there was a slight spike of popularity in 2021, but that's actually because the survey was, ex was pushed out within the Laravel community. So, sorry, there was a disproportionate number of Laravel respondents which pushed that uh, usage up. You might also notice that JavaScript's popularity is declining, but that's actually mostly because the JavaScript ecosystem is finally moving on to a type language in the form of TypeScript. So that's why that's going up. And we can see a similar upwards trend from uh, Rust. So given that Drupal is built in PHP, I find this a little bit of a worrying trend because we need uh, people who want to work with the PHP uh, to help us build uh, Drupal. And there's also another trend that I'm seeing, uh, not related to the language, but actually developers are starting to discover that if they, write, if they don't write the code themselves, then there's less chance that they introduce bugs and fewer bugs that they need to fix. And of course, this is something we knew, we have modules, but other communities are seeing this in the form of SaaS services. Uh, so we can see that with these meta frameworks also going hand in hand, where they're making it easier to fetch external data, not having to think about your data modeling, but really focusing on providing the value that you want within your web application and taking all of the chores out of your uh, hands. So like I said, in Rust, it's not quite there yet, but I think it will be in a few years. Uh, and also when I talk to JavaScript and Rust developers at conferences, I notice uh, these trends because whenever I ask them about a scaling problem or I want to do something extra within Drupal, the first thing they tell me is, oh, just use that SaaS service. And I'm like, okay, but why? Because I can already do it uh, myself. And if you happen to be here as a manager and you don't just want to take my word for it, then take McKinsey and Company's word for it because this was actually the headline of one of their uh, research publications. So to paint the landscape, I want to take a look at some of these SaaS services that people uh, might use in five different categories. So commerce, authentication, web forms, uh, newsletters, and headless content management systems. And I think the undeniable winner in the commerce space is Shopify. They don't only offer a way to just set up a simple web shop, but they're really pushing their API story to cater to developers. They launched Hydrogen, which allows you to build any front-end uh, UI that you can just run within their code to make it show up in your shop. In authentication, there are two large, large ones. There's, there's Auth0 uh, and there's Dscope, uh, and these make it easy to authenticate with all sorts of different services. Webforms see, sees a lot more competition. So you have Google Forms, uh, you have Typeform, SurveyMonkey, and HubSpot, and then many others, but I couldn't fit them all on my slides. Newsletters, three big ones, ConvertKit, uh, MailChimp, Substack, and many more. So if you don't want to build this yourself, there's plenty of services to do your, this for you. And finally, some more direct competitors with Drupal. We have the headless CMS. We have HiGraph, which was formerly Graph CMS. We have Content AI and React Bricks. And this is also a space that is rapidly growing, providing more offerings, trying to tell all these other communities, you don't need to do your own data management. We can do it for you. You can just query it from us. So does that mean we can do everything with a SaaS service and a JavaScript or a Rust application now and we can retire Drupal, all is done? No. I don't think so, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, I think Drupal still has tremendous power, uh, and you're all here, you're using Drupal, so you know this. Uh, but I do think we need to make some changes and improve in some key areas so that we can be ready for this new trend and appeal to other communities. I think there are a few uh, key takeaways that I see. So business logic over chores, so people don't want to do all the uh, authentication, content modeling, uh, building the API. They just want to focus on delivering value. Makes sense. 
strip ty strict typing everywhere. Uh, it just catches so much bugs if something at build time tells you that something is null, rather than hearing your customer complain about a wide screen of death. Uh, and being API first, because we don't just have a web client anymore. You have mobile, you have your AI chat client that needs to ingest data and behavior, uh, and all sorts of other clients. And we've been ahead of these trends in some ways. Uh, like Drupal has a strong module system uh, that helps you get going quickly. You just install the module and up you go. Uh, we're rapidly adopting PHP Stan uh, and PHP Stan Drupal. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and we have GraphQL and JSON API. So if you're using Drupal, you can do all these things. And one of the things we've been really good at in Drupal 8, 9, 10 is improving this developer experience and getting people going quickly. Uh, we've adopted new language features. We're now in PHP 8.1, which gives us a lot of fun stuff to work with. Uh, and I don't know if everyone has already looked at single directory components, but that gives you the componentization from React that I've always really wanted in Drupal. So that's really, I was really happy to see that launch. But the problem is that you really only get this developer experience when you're already a PHP developer. So this doesn't really help the, pe the people in the JavaScript or the Rust community to get them excited uh, for Drupal. So there's a lot of people out there building websites that are not using PHP, and they might even have a negative view of PHP. And we could see this in the declining trend of PHP's popularity. Um, and I've asked some JavaScript developers that I know, like, hey, what do you think of PHP? And they always come to me, yeah. PHP, like it's untyped, it's weird functions. I'm like, okay, so they're stuck in PHP 4.0. Maybe they got up to 5.6, but they don't know all the cool stuff of 7.4, 8.0, 8.1, .8 uh, and onwards. So we'll need to do something to give them a tool that shows them, like, look, this is what you can build uh, with PHP. And when I tell them about PHP, then like, look, my day-to-day -day PHP development fully strictly types. I can do really cool things with data objects. Then they suddenly get more interested because you, they can, you can show them that you can do cool things with the language. So we're facing an uphill battle, but I do think there is part for Drupal to uh, ch help change this trend and image of PHP. Uh, but we'll have to do a bit of work. So. A major way, uh, in my opinion, is to increase Drupal's po popularity and show that it can be awesome, is to show that developers can use Drupal without using Drupal. And you might be looking at me, uh, okay. But when talking with developers at the other, in these other communities, they're looking for easy to use services. And I see some of these services that I mentioned at conferences, they have huge booths, a lot of money, so apparently they're doing really well. But it's always, it feels a little bit funny to me because whenever they tell me about their features, I'm like, okay, cool. That's the entity API, that's the field API, that's JSON API, that's GraphQL. It's all these things that we have in Drupal. So I'm thinking like, why do we need to install, have people install Drupal to let them use Drupal? Uh, why can't we just let them use Drupal as a SaaS service? So let's take another look at this SaaS uh, category overview, and then look at how we could compete with the modules that we already have. And these are, I think, some of the modules uh, that we could deploy for these people in other communities and have them talk to as a SaaS service. Of course, we have commerce, the commerce module, the entire uh, ecosystem. I think that in itself could be a SaaS product. Maybe we can't yet compete with Shopify, but I think for a large part of the, or a large amount of the use case of people setting up shops, uh, we can do fine. And for authentication, I think we have a really good case of being able to compete with uh, Auth0 and the like, because we have so many modules that can authenticate with external things. So we take uh, social auth for your Facebook, Google, all those integration. We have simple SAML for the enterprise side. Office 365, uh, and then we could expose that with OAuth, because that is something that the JavaScript community is very familiar with. They use OAuth pretty much for everything. Um, and it's, I listen to podcasts and I hear ads about entire services being set up for helping people with compliance. You always see these enterprise versions of SaaS services where SAML is hidden behind money. 
And I'm like, we have this module, this already works, so why couldn't we build an authentication service on Drupal? For web forms, the answer is easy. We have the web forms module. For newsletter, that needs a little bit more logic, but we have ways to let people build uh, this logic. We have the message module to let them make messages, and of course, we have uh, rules uh, or events, condition, action uh, as an alternative. And of course, the headless CMS. And that's where we already have the entity system, the field API. We can expose it with the entity construction kit. And then they can use either GraphQL or JSON API. And I was at a GraphQL meetup recently, and one of the big things they introduced was this tool that could translate a REST API into GraphQL or the other way around. And I'm like, we don't need those tools. We can just enable the other module, and we're good to go, and we can tweak it as needed. So that would be really easy to have available, or really useful to have available as a service. At DrupalCon Portland in 2022, in his Dries notes, Dries set out the goal for ambitious site builders. And I think the initiative is great, uh, but I also think we're missing out. Because the ambitious site builder is really aimed at getting people uh, using Drupal and building with Drupal and then starting to contribute to Drupal. But I think all the people that are not willing to dabble in PHP are not going to become uh, these ambitious site builders. So we're missing out on a huge uh, developer uh, community. And Drupal has a great permission system. But I think when we focus on site builders, we're usually thinking about people that have access to the hosting. So most of the administrative permissions for modules are a little bit too broad. And that makes it really difficult to make these SaaS services that I described. Because you don't want to give them the site builder permissions, but you want to give them slightly less. Similarly, when we build user interfaces in Contrib modules, we usually expose these hosting things with other settings in the same uh, screens. We ask people to configure file paths or secrets. And that's also not something you would want to expose uh, in a SaaS service. So we often give site builders great responsibility to make sure that they don't actually break their sites. And I think if we look at this SaaS model, and we look at what Drupal is capable of, I think the step to get there is relatively small. Uh, it's usually splitting a configuration screen so that we can maybe hide the hosting-specific stuff, but give them access to the other things. Introducing a few more permissions to make sure that that can actually be hidden or exposed uh, correctly. And I think by making that improvement and offering a limited scope of Drupal installations in this SaaS form, we, can be, we are able to compete with these purpose-built uh, SaaS offerings. And we can get people excited about these services. And we can say, like, look, that's built with Drupal. That's what you can use Drupal for. And just as an example, um, I may be biased. I work uh, for Open Social, where we provide community experience platforms as a service. So some of these problems I have experienced. And if you look at Open Social's marketing website, then you'll see that we provide quite a lot of extensions to our customers. And a lot of these are Drupal modules that we just built a little bit of a UI layer and permission system on top of to cover this. We're exposing it to not quite site builders problem. Um, and I want to show you a little example of what we did with the simple SAML module. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with SAML, uh, it allows one platform to act as a service provider who wants to authenticate some user. And that platform does that with another platform, the identity provider, which actually stores uh, all the user data and knows who the user is. And this is very common if you're working with large organizations and enterprises. A lot of them want this because they have all their access and user data centrally managed and other services that communicate with that uh, and don't need to know if the user can log in or don't even need to know login details. So Drupal has a great module for this that uses the PHP library under the hood. Um, and this is one of the three screens provided by default. And I don't expect everyone to be able to see it, so I want to 
uh, zoom in a little bit. What I want you to focus on is the authentication source for SP setting. This is something that needs to match a value that is in the auth sources.php, which is a file that's on your file system. And after setup, that value is static. But if you change it in the auth sources and not in Drupal or the other way around, your authentication will break and you'll get something that's probably not trivial to debug as an end user. So in a SaaS environment, the people don't have access to that file. They don't know what to do with this, and they shouldn't be uh, seeing this. So what we did is we made a wrapper around the simple SAML PHP auth module uh, to make sure that we hit this from our users and so that they could configure uh, simple SAML without our intervention, because we've when we first did this, it was actually a lot of work to set this up for users because they had all the information and we needed to ask them for the right information. So the first thing we did is we hit all the existing screens by introducing some new permissions. Uh, and we created a new screen. And the first thing you see on the new screen is all the URLs, all the data that they might need on their side to configure the identity provider because it needs to know some information about the service provider that it's communicating with. Um, you can also see the enable disable toggle is still there if they want to enable disable it. There's some information on how they can test it, debug it. What we often see is external uh, sites wanting to send people to the platform, have them logged in immediately and show up on the uh, platform logged in. So that's the login URL. Um, and we saw this issue with the auth sources, which required us to copy and paste things in it. But we decided, hey, that's a PHP file. It's running PHP. So rather than have some static array in there as configuration, why don't we bootstrap Drupal and just fetch the configuration from the database? So that means it's now self-contained. Whatever our customers configure gets loaded in there automatically. And to help them configure that, we introduced uh, some new config entities, gave them a nice little uh, screen, uh, a very simple form, they just paste in their metadata file or the URL where they can get it. And if they work with an identity provider, this is something they usually know how to do. Um, and I think it's exactly these kind of changes that can make Drupal suitable for a SaaS environment so we can more easily sell it to people even if they don't want to install Drupal themselves. But it's also just a better experience for site builders because they no longer need to change a PHP file. Um, but they can just configure the module and there's less things for them to actually break. And we still have the old settings available uh, to developers in case we do need to do something there, but we find that's usually no uh, longer the case. So if you take this and you take, for example, the simple OAuth module installed on the other side, then that would be your uh, simple SAML integration for a uh, client-side application that doesn't need to know simple SAML but only needs to know OAuth. So that's the start of a service that compete, can compete with this Auth0 um, service. Now, I don't think UX is uh, the only challenge. There's some other important aspects that I think we'll need to work on. Uh, so if you're looking for something to sprint on this week, then here are some issues for you. I think the first one is a gap in what we can build with Drupal. So Drupal is built originally to handle web requests and do things within that request and then go away again. But if we look at JavaScript and Rust, then these are built as long-running processes, so it's easy to do things like background tasks. Uh, and if I want to do that with Drupal, I have to jump through a lot of hoops. At OpenSocial, we build a real-time chat uh, with Drupal, and the real-time part is some site uh, application that just makes a lot of queries to Drupal uh, because I need to have all the Drupal business logic for data fetching of my entities, access handling, um, and that is not something that works in a real-time uh, manner. So, um, yeah, and even though the event loop in PHP is actually older than Node.js, we're quite a bit behind in terms of capabilities. Uh, we're catching up, like libraries like React PHP, Swool, uh, and AMP, they're growing in uh, popularity. And there's also now Revolt, which is a collaboration between React PHP and AMP. Uh, and the introduction of Fibers in 8.1 gave them a really good primitive for these libraries to build on and continue uh, 
expanding. But I do think there are some things that stand in Drupal's way. Uh, for example, we have a lot of global caching. Uh, this prevents building things like GraphQL subscriptions that we would need for our real-time chats. Uh, and yeah, so uh, thankfully there's already a few issues. So there's 22.18.651, see it at the bottom there. And there's also an issue specifically for fibers. I always recommend starting with the left one because it links to way more other issues that help you explore what is needed to get Drupal async. And additionally, the Drupal sites that we're building are becoming ever more complex. Uh, we're trying to make uh, Drupal more usable in SaaS environments. I see I forgot an image here. Uh, and real-time process will be no exception. So we'll also have to continue improving the developer experience itself. Once we can show people that SaaS services built on Drupal are cool, hopefully get them excited to build their own, uh, we'll still need to improve PHP stand, uh, improve type safety within Drupal, one of the things I'm really hoping for is that we can maybe make breaking changes in the type annotations and force contract projects to actually use PHP stand as an upgrade tool, because then in a major version, we can just say we move the types from the annotation to the PHP world, and it doesn't have to count as a breaking change because they can get advanced warnings. And PHP stand in that sense is great because you can just start at the highest level, push everything in a baseline, and slowly add types to your uh, project. Now, I'm happy to say that what I'm presenting isn't entirely new. Uh, at Open Social, we've been doing this for a few years now. And actually, just two weeks ago, uh, there was a new SaaS service announced that was powered by Drupal, which is called 12 Bricks. So they're already uh, starting to use Drupal as well in this SaaS model. And I know that the people behind FarmOS, I think FarmOS is really cool. Uh, piece of software for farm and agriculture management. So you should definitely check out what they're uh, doing, even if you don't own a farm. Just some of the uh, things they manage with their software is cool. They're thinking of how they can maybe turn their distribution into a SaaS service as well, uh, because then they can more easily do the hosting for their end users who want to be working on their farm and not working on Drupal. There's another distribution that I often look at for examples of how to do things in uh, distributions, which is Thunder. Um, they have thunder.org as an organization behind the Thunder project. I don't know if they want to make thunder.com for the WordPress.com equivalent for uh, Thunder. Uh, and maybe someone wants to start something else using this entity construction kit, using GraphQL Compose or GraphQL Core Schema to automatic, automatically generate a GraphQL API uh, based on uh, the things that users configure. So Dries proposed Drupal for ambitious site builders, and I would like to tweak that slightly to Drupal for ambitious site builders and Drupal for SaaS. Thank you. I think we had a microphone somewhere. I don't know where that ended up, but maybe we can use that for questions. If anyone has any questions. I see one in the middle, yes. So, so one of the things that I'm often thankful for as a PHP developer is that we don't have that slide that you showed about JavaScript, where everything changes all the time. Um, and in, in the backend world, people have been burned before. Like there was this Ruby on Rails thing that was so popular, and everyone tried to get websites developed in that, and then it just vanished. Um, so my question is, with that background, where would you put the current trends with Rust against that story of Ruby on Rails? Because I've noticed that in the, in the backend scene, things tend to get popular for a while and then they just you know, go away and everyone goes back to the old thing that they all trust. Um, I, I understand your concern. Um, I think the 
The trap that we can fall into is to assume that those communities are going to stay as turbulent as they are. Because I think um, if, we look at, if we look at the trends that we had, you can see there was a lot of experimentation, a lot of people looking at what was happening and then saying, oh, I don't quite like this. Let me try it some other way. Um, and I think we're starting to see in the JavaScript community specifically, I think in the Rust, we're, if the Rust community, we're a few years out of that happening, where people are coalescing around these are the things that work well and these are the things that we can scale. Um, and I think what I'm worried about is that they're going to figure out like one or two of these large projects where they're like, okay, this is how it works. And we can already see that happening with Next.js in the React community where server-side components is something React is working on so that you can render your component on the server, just stream back the data so you can do very complex computations if you want or have your secrets within your component. Um, that was first implemented in Next.js, and a lot of new JavaScript users don't really know about React itself. They just know Next.js. They use Next, and then like that happens to have React, but they don't care. They're just going with it. Um, so in terms of being burned by a service, I think it's going to probably happen a few times. I don't think all of the projects I showed can survive. I think a lot of them will for a long time, and then people might migrate away. I mean, Drupal 7 has been with us for 14 years, going on 15 next year. Um, so even some of those projects that people are using now, there's going to be companies that are invested in having that work on such a timeline. So they'll keep pushing it for that amount of time before they might be, OK, now we actually um, need to switch. So I really think that the worst thing we can do is think like, oh, but they're still changing, they're still changing. And then once they stop changing, we're too late in actually getting them excited about, uh, about us. I hope that answers your question. Mostly. Yeah, I'm not entirely familiar with the, with the Ruby story, so I can't quite comment on that. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, then thank you. I, if you disagree completely with what I said, just come after me. I would love to hear it. If you do agree, I would also love to hear it. But yeah, really uh, enjoy your thoughts. Thanks.